If you had to describe your, your business idea to me and I'm an investor in your business, what, what's, the, what's the pitch? Um, how did how did this kind of business plan come up? This has always been kind of uh, something in me that feels like what I want to do. Starting a business or no, not starting a business using design to serve uh, the underserved. Not so, start, but the, not the starting a business part. Not the starting a business part. This, I can't believe I'm telling you all this because this is all bad practice. Don't worry about <laughs> but, it. It's, it's part, this is how you get started. So Paige is a licensed architect. She's living and practicing in Alabama. She's a graduate of Auburn University, Auburn's home to the rural studio. And if you're familiar with the rural studio, they generally work to serve the underserved portions of sort of rural Alabama. And so she's looking to build a business in a similar vein. She wants to work with middle income clients and use the profits and proceeds to serve the underserved portions of her community. So our challenge is to run the numbers and make her business idea real. And so I thought this was a great representative conversation because it touches on all the fears and concerns and realities of practice that we all face. But what I'm trying to do is get you to, to um, kind of create the story, tell the story of like, okay, how did, like, how did this form? Uh, because to me, what, as, if I think about this as a business, um, it's, you've, you've chosen one of the most difficult businesses to do, right? right. You're, you're finding a place where there's very low margin and you're trying to extract value off of just that little slice of margin. And right. so you have to be really passionate about this. You have to really care about it. And part of that is having a story that I think other people can buy into because as I read your business model, you're, you're asking other people to buy into that a little bit, right? Right. Okay. So maybe let's, let's come at it from a little bit of a different angle. Um, if you had to describe your, your business idea to me and I'm an investor in your business, what, what's the, what's the pitch? <laughs> um, Can I get technical for a second? Sure. This is totally ignoring your question. It's all right. We're working it out. This is it should be helpful to you. So if it's this isn't helpful to you, then we should move on. So Mass Design Group recently released a book, um, and they kind of explain their strategy as to how they do what they do, um, and they said that they are set up as a nonprofit, um, and one of the benefits of that is that. They can have, you know, new students coming in. They can take advantage of the, if you work for us for 10 years, your debt is, student debt is relieved, which was a good point. Um, but they were also able to get to a place where they were able to pay competitive salaries to folks working for them. And part of that had to do with their business model, which um, involves what they call a uh, a catalyst uh, fund. Okay. So they're taking in capital from somewhere in this nonprofit. They basically like kind of fund themselves for those initial important conversations, kind of pre-design and then into schematic design. And then they, you get to kind of around DD, CD, you get to a point where you can see that the, the project is going to come to fruition and the risk goes down um, of, you know, having wasted that money and the, um, the client is in like more confident in paying the design fees. So, so somehow they're getting, they're convincing investors like you were just talking about to um, donate to their nonprofit catalyst fund. It would be interesting if you, I don't know if you know anybody there or if you can make contact with someone there to really talk that through because um, I did see a parallel. My wife is a scientist, so she works at a lab. She runs a research lab. The lab is a nonprofit. Um, and so their funding is all grant derived. So this is kind of the model that you're talking about. But one of the sort of idiosyncrasies of that grant funding model, and this may not tr be true for mass design, is that those grants come with all kinds of stipulations, not, not right. the least of which is a percentage cap on what you can use for paying salaries, for example. So 
there's a 17% cap on the grant hmm. funding for paying salaries. So just, you know, talking round numbers, you get a hundred thousand dollar grant for, you know, X project, 17 of that goes to paying fees. So I don't know what their business model is. And if they're working with sort of benefactors, people who aren't attaching the same strings, it may be different. Uh, but I do know structuring as a nonprofit has has pretty big implications. Right. And, and I did also see in your proposal that you were trying to avoid that. Yeah, trying to avoid that. So <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, it's it's cool to have these as examples um, because I think there's a lot to learn there. But also, I think what it suggests to me is that some of these ideas operate at scale and they're hard to make work at an individual scale. I did look uh, deeper into Epicenter. Mm -hmm. Have you talked to them at all? Um, I could. I haven't. I haven't, but I know them uh, personally from school. They were Auburn graduates. Sure. So, I mean, that would be an interesting thing to look at because as I just looked through, they started with a lot of gusto. It doesn't seem like it has a lot of momentum. And actually, I'd just probably just call them and say, or send them an email and say, hey, like, I'm thinking about doing the same thing <laughs> or very similar thing here right. in Alabama. So, like, maybe there's even some synergy that you guys could develop there. I just wonder um, if it, if the business model hasn't proved itself to be maybe not quite what they were thinking it was. Um, no, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay. It, just coming back to the investor thing again, if, if you had to pitch me as an investor, how would I make money? Because I mean, in some ways, you're going to be investing in this business, right? You are the investor. What's the business model that makes the pitch to you that it's going to work? Because it has to be self-sustaining, right? Yeah. Um, I was hoping to find that buried in mass design groups model since they have been so successful. Uh -huh. um, so I was a little disappointed to see that, you know, that they are structured as a nonprofit. <laughs> if I look at what you're, what you're telling me here, I mean, you're looking to do standard design, active design services, right? And you're looking to work with what kind of clients? Well, okay. So yeah, so that's my like, how, how do we get more practical and out of dream world and make it work? And that was kind of one thought I had is, can I have, you know, a, a firm that uh, a lot of firms I'm aware uh, devote a certain amount of work to pro bono work. Um, so is there a way I can have a for-profit normal kind of uh, firm to some extent that can devote a higher percentage of that work to, to underserved clients, but not on a pro bono basis, more as like a partnership, there's some investment on their behalf, more like a habitat model, if that makes sense. Okay. You know, kind of sweat equity kind of thing, but not necessarily. If we say for a moment, like the, if the not-for-profit model is aspirational, that's probably a phase two. And I think you're right to kind of dial it back to reality. Like this is this is Paige and maybe someone else or maybe two other people. I don't know how yeah. many people. Are you envisioning like a small group of you? Uh, that would be my hope because one of the kind of questions I've had for you is as kind of a sole practitioner or working by yourself, you know, missing that collaborative problem solving and, you know, those kinds of things is it seems like a, a tougher, tougher road. Definitely is. Yep. And, yeah. and I think if you are worried about that and thinking about that right now, uh, I would say um, it's going to get worse. <laughs> so, yeah. so I would say like, you know, it helps to share and shoulder the burden. It means your profits, which already look pretty slim. Um, right. They get shared amongst the partners and you're obviously sharing risk and, I think a lot of great things can come out of those partnerships. And, and you, if you, if it were you and someone else having someone to bounce ideas off of a partner like that, I don't know if you're married or uh, have a spouse or a significant other. Um, I end up doing that. And it's, and for me, it's like, well, it's not quite the right fit. So I need to seek those things out elsewhere. So I do that, you know, I have other means of doing that, like masterminds and other connections that I have just out in the world. 
but I live in a remote place, you know, so there's not someone in the studio who's critiquing my work unless it's a client or a contractor or, you know, one of the sort of design team that I'm working with, you know, one of my consultants. So I think mm -hmm. if you're feeling that, um, solitude is not a good thing. If the solitude feels more like loneliness, then that's not going to be great for you. But there's been a lot of benefits, I think, to remaining a team of one early on in that I got to make all the decisions and I got to make the design moves and the pivots and the changes. And, you know, I had the freedom to experiment with a lot of different things. Once you add another partner into that mix, and I've done this with a bunch of different other projects that I'm working on now, um, where I'm partnering with other people, it's more difficult. Um, I don't know what your personality is as a designer, but I find it hard being deferential <laughs> to other people. <laughs> so I, for me, this works well. But if you know yourself well enough to say, I don't like working in solitude, like you're working alone right now, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm presuming you're not loving that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's I'm working out of a co working space right now for that very reason. Yeah, because <laughs> being in my home for you know a year was pushing me to the brink. Sure, yeah, because I, I also live alone, so it was just myself all the time. Oh, yes, that's real. So it's super difficult. So I think you're right to, to think about that. Um, and also, I mean, do you have someone in mind that you might start this with, or is this far in the future? I, I couldn't tell. Yeah, um. N not confidently. I have a, a couple uh, potential leads, but nothing that's a clear answer. So um, I, I'm definitely not ready to take any steps in the next two months or any, not take any steps, but I'm not about to cut ties in the next two months or anything like that. One of the things I was thinking is like, okay, if you really are seeking these middle income clients, it sounds like your other firm maybe is a larger entity and they'd never take on residential work. So this may not even fit in the same bucket of a project that they would do, right? Right. So my my other thought along those lines would be um, uh, the kind of David Baker architect approach where you partner with developers and do large scale affordable housing um, and uh, that I could see potentially pitching to my firm as a viable, you know, new studio within their, within the firm. Right. And I mean, does that satisfy some of those same needs that you have to kind of serve that market or? Uh, to an extent, um, if it, it fits, I'd say 70% of the, of kind of the initial service opportunities, but there's, um, I don't, I don't know that it's the long-term goal. If that makes sense. Yeah. Feels more hands-off maybe a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It feels safer. Sure. Yeah. Well, I was just trying to think just based on what your description here was, if, if the business model is to use one client base to then sort of subsidize a second client base that you're working with, um, what income group are you targeting? Like the middle income clients now, who's serving them right now? Mostly themselves, right? Because you don't have to do a residential project, at least in Alabama, you do not have to have a licensed architect. And so it's not an easy sell. Um, I do have, uh, so my sister, uh, her family needed some remodel work done on their home uh, this past year, which I uh, designed and um, you know, that generated some interest amongst, you know, friends of hers, that kind of thing. So there's the potential to leverage that into maybe one or two spinoff projects. Um, what kind of margin are we talking here? Do you mind sharing? Oh, what do you mean? Uh, what was the fee? Did you charge your sister anything or no? I didn't know. I know. This I get is bad. It. Let me ask you a different way. Uh, what What was the budget for it? 140000 Okay. And what would you, if, if that were a client, what would you have charged? Um, I probably, um, uh, what I understand is a normal practice is eight to 10%. Yeah. Even for a smaller, the smaller, the budget, higher percentage, right? Cause you still have all the same design stuff to do, but you just got to <laughs> fit it into, you know, the budget is just smaller. So the percentage of your fee would actually be like 
that would be a hard project to make money on, I would think. How long did it take you? Um, well, not very long because I didn't develop full on uh, construction documents, kind of gave it to the contractor. This, I can't believe I'm telling you all this because this is all bad practice. Um, Don't worry about but, it. It's, it's part, this is how you get started. Yeah. So it was basically like SDDD type uh, drawings that the contractor kind of took and ran with. And then um, she would send me questions during the construction process. Um, so it was not very hands-on. So a week to do that? 40 hours? Less than that? Oh, um, I'm trying to get you to run the numbers. <laughs> yeah, we'll say 80 hours to be safe. Okay. So if I figure you're the only one uh, working there, 80 hours of design time, you're going to have to do other things. So I would figure a 50% utilization. So that's basically a month's worth of work. Okay. And a 10% fee on that would be 14,000 bucks. You said the budget was 140. Assign probably half of that to taxes and expenses. So you got 7,000 bucks to live on. If you did one of those a month times 12 months is 84,000 a year. So That's you, doable. You could do that, right? I mean, if yeah. you just run the math on it, you could do that, but you have to have one of those every single month. And the thing is, it's more than one because it's going to get put on hold and you don't get all the fee all at once, right? Yeah. And like you have to yeah. work through it. And then the other challenge is how do you sell this to people who don't know they need it? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. So no. that's that's why I, I want you to – one of the things that you know I was thinking about was as a designer yourself, you know, how can you treat this like a design problem? How can you treat the business like a design problem? Because you have this goal of serving this sort of underserved piece here, right? And it's cool. It's aspirational. But like you've got to take some of that $14,000 worth of fee in that month and then also serve someone else, right? So that leaves less room for you to act. I mean, that's just me saying you're the partner of this firm and you're doing 50% utilization. That's hard. I, speaking from experience, it's hard to work 50% of your time on billable stuff if you're trying to do the marketing and the billing and all the other stuff that comes along with it. You're going to find yourself very, very constrained by that number. So once mm -hmm. you add in this sort of other component, it gets more difficult. So yeah. it starts to suggest to me you have to either look for more margin or you have to change the sort of value equation. Like, you know... I, and I don't know what that is. These are really more just questions for you. But, you know, um, if you're going to treat this like a design problem, have you thought about other, like, are there other business models that you looked at? Because there, as I think about it, there's probably other ways to serve that group of people that you're looking to serve. Um, for example, you know, one way would be to work with very wealthy clients and use that fee to fund another operation, right? Like you take the proceeds of that and you say, okay, we're doing this other program off on the side. Maybe you run it, maybe you don't, I don't know. Um, have you thought about any other kind of like backdoor solutions or out of the box solutions or what, what's, tell me about that. Yeah, um, in Birmingham at least, there's a pretty, I have the impression that there's a pretty saturated market uh, market or options available for high-end residential. Um, and you have that impression <laughs> how, um, just looking at the types of residential firms that are available, <laughs> which that is the only option, which could also be because that's the only profitable option. <laughs> I don't, I mean, it sounds to me like that, that doesn't interest you at all. And I'm not trying to make you do something you don't want to do. I'm just thinking of ways like if, if this is the end goal over here, how do you, how do you achieve that end goal? And maybe it's, yeah. like, maybe you're just working with Auburn and like, you've got a whole little kind of school inside of your practice that is like training ground for kids. I don't know. I don't know what it yeah. looks like, but it seems like 
you need more options out on the periphery of this thing. And, you know, that's what right. we do as architects, right? Are you a licensed architect? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, you could essentially take on interns and have, give them some practical experience in exchange for this. And yeah, what that looks like from a liability standpoint, I don't really know. Uh, you, like I said, I think you are, you're choosing a really hard problem to solve. And there's, there's a reason why you probably don't see too many firms in this space because it's right. difficult to do in the environment, in a profit environment. And I think, you know, okay. school situation, that umbrella of that provides certain protections um, and capabilities that is harder to do when you're trying to make the math work. Because, you know, as I look at your business proposal, the first thing I, I do as a business owner, and I've been doing this only seven years, so take that for what you will, but running the numbers has always been the day one activity for me. So what you and I just did there, that utilization, I, I presume you're doing that for the projects that you're managing right now, right? Um, kind of. So I'm co-managing projects and learning how to do that. Okay. So that it's intimidating to me at the moment. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th those are just, you know, those are calculations that you need to be able to run and, um, so that you can make the business work for you. Because if you launch this thing and you throw six months of savings into it. I don't know if you have any savings or not, but um, you don't want to just be throwing it out the window. You want to have a plan for how you're going to reach your revenue targets. And you know, everyone has right. to have revenue targets, right? And right. part of what you can do now uh, while you're working remotely and maybe have a little more freedom and flexibility to do these things is like, look for those clients that you know, you're thinking of serving. And you're telling me it's middle income clients. Um, and honestly, that's where I started with the design of my own home. You know, I said, oh, well, I've got these plan sets I can design. And I set, put up this plan shop and I'm going to serve the people like me. You know, I had a modest income when I started this, this business. And I thought, geez, I mean, even I can't afford to work with someone like myself, you know, to, to do this. And when I hear you talk, that kind of, that's what I hear you saying. And as yeah. I got into it, what I realized was... Um, the value you you need to make a certain value proposition and the value proposition to a middle income client doesn't lie in design or the plan set it oftentimes lies in convenience and so that may not be the answer that you come to as you do this research but i would guess that it wouldn't be far off um, if you think about someone who's getting ready to build their first home where where are they at from a headspace standpoint right they got a busy life, lots going on, unfamiliar with the process. Architects are out of reach and unaffordable. So I'm going to go to the builder. Like that's what people do. Middle income people around here, they go right to a builder. And oftentimes that's the builder says, well, you can't afford to do a custom build. It's going to have to be a modular home. And I don't know if they do modular production housing by you, but that's pretty much what middle income people around here do. And the plans are horrible. They're just abysmal. So one of the ideas that I had was like, well, if there's a, if that's the market that you're trying to serve, you need to find out where those people in your market are going to get those services right now. And if it's a builder or if it's a you know, modular home company, why don't you fit yourself in the middle of that value proposition? Because they need the help, clearly. <laughs> um, or you invent something like that. Like you become the person who delivers those things. And maybe a part of that business is, okay, we're doing the sort of lower end version of this. We got the middle end, we got the middle version, and then we got the high end version. Which one do you want kind of thing? And mm -hmm. um, I start to think about those things. Um, when you're looking at the margin and the value exchange in there, you, you really have to, you know, if you think about like how Walmart operates, right? Uh, because I've been designing products lately, this is how my head's going. Like, they're operating at such a huge scale because their margins are so thin, right? But you're talking about taking a thin margin and then making it operate at a small scale, right? I presume the, the, the client base that you're talking about is not huge, right? Right. It's just really hard to do. Well, so what about a plan book of options, like specifically for this, like hone in on 
the zones, the Alabama um, humidity, and you know that provides details for you know where you're going to put your thermal barrier, those kinds of things. Like, is that um, plausible? <laughs> I mean, it certainly is. And I think it's all cool stuff to try. That should be in your stable of options. But let's just run the numbers on that for a minute. What What would you sell something like that for? What would you sell something like that for? Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so describe to me what it is. Is it a physical book? Is it a plan set? Is it like PDFs? Or what is it? Maybe like five different design options. Um that are each expandable, like, you know, number of bedrooms, that kind of thing. Um, I, yeah, is that so what you're asking? It, um, kind of, but it, um, some of this I think is obviously it's just ideas that you're, you know, we're throwing out here, but um, we kind of started with maybe the passive income piece, right? That it's a right. distinct product. Um, right. And in that sense, you know, as I think about, developers that have approached me, like you can license your plan sets and it's, it's a great way to make money. Um, so these guys will take your plan and, you know, if they're building a hundred units, you get a licensing fee off of that. And it just depends on what kind of housing they're building and where it is. And, you know, I think when I think of middle income, like the developers are all going after this middle income group because as the economy expands, Lower income people are moving into the middle income, middle income are moving out. So it's like these multifamily units. And then as the economy contracts, the upper income are moving back into the middle income. So it's always filled. Like it's a really good profitable business model. So developers, they want to do that. And it's a great passive income model for them. So if you can tap into that value chain, that's a great opportunity for licensing something like that. But that's less about, I think, creating um, a design sort of template plan book. I mean, it could be something you do and just say, this is an option, but it's, it would be more about working with that developer and saying, hey, this is the style of stuff that I do. Like, do you like it? We can turn this into multifamily stuff that's affordable. Um, and then, and so you really, you start crafting a relationship that looks more like that um, as opposed to the thing that I tried to do, which was sell plan sets directly to, consumers and this idea about like details that make sense for the climate builders know that's important um banks and lending institutions know that it's important developers know that's important consumers don't know that stuff's important they they really don't so i don't think that's where the value proposition is and then if we just hmm. back into this idea of selling a book you know a book is let's say it's a 20 dollar book or something like that maybe it's a 50 dollar book you 50% of that goes away immediately just to margin. Okay. So like, cause you got to get the thing printed and you distribute it and ship it and all those things. So now you're working with 25 bucks or 10 bucks. <laughs> you got to sell yeah. an awful lot of those, you know, to, to really have it be meaningful. So I think, you know, book in a lot of ways or some plan set or detail component is more about getting someone to work with you and then, figuring out where the value ex is exchanging hands and you finding a way to get in the middle of that. And, you know, some of the things that I've done in the past are like, if a developer wants to work with me, we talk about like an equity exchange, like I'll design these plan sets for free, but I want some equity in the monthly revenue. Cause that like, that could make a huge difference in your business. Right. Have you ever thought about doing that? Or does that excite you like design build or working with a developer to kind of, figure out yeah. the, the numbers. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that brings in the scale piece, right? And also developers have access to capital and lending institutions and relationships that you probably don't, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, maybe as part of this sort of research process, it's, and, and this could even extend to finding a partner in this right. is, um, looking for people who have those connections out in the community rather than, and you probably, it's much easier for you to look in your circle of architectural friends. Uh, but maybe those aren't the best relationships or the ones that you need to mind to actually get this business off the ground. I mean, I, 
looked at having a sort of development arm of my own business at one point too. And I met with several developers and it was really interesting because it taught me so much about what I didn't know in the business. Um, Mm. And for you to make this work, you, um, I would recommend you really sit hard with those numbers and really think about them. And it's, it's not where your natural tendencies lie. I can tell, um, but it's, but that's good. Like you want those little areas to be exposed and you want to know your weaknesses because if you actually walk into a meeting with a developer and you don't know your numbers, you are at a major disadvantage. Right. (laughs) Like if you had this conversation with a developer, they'll squash you. It's, and actually when you're working with clients, when you have a command of the numbers, you own the room. It, it's pretty remarkable because hmm. that's the thing they know best. And if you know that best, plus you know all the architecture stuff, you're like you're like a queen in the room. I mean, you, you own it. I, I promise you. So I think those are good things maybe for you to really pull back and say, okay, um, you know, the reason I was asking you in the very beginning, like, why do you want to do this? What you know, what need are you fulfilling for yourself and what exactly does that look like is because you have to get down to those pieces where you're really passionate about this thing. Like this is the thing that I need to do because that's the only thing that's going to drive this forward. When you're working with thin margins, you have to do that. So I have a video that I did on this very thing. And I also have this whole spreadsheet that goes with it, which is kind of just basic fundamentals. And all it does is, um, have you ever done a side hustle? Have you worked on any kind of moonlighting where you've actually made money? Uh, no. Okay. So you've never <laughs> filed a Schedule C or anything like that for your taxes? No. Okay. Mm-mm. So part of what this does is it breaks down how you're going to have to file taxes. And those okay. line items directly correlate to your expenses as a business. So when you start this business, whatever it looks like, if you're a sole proprietor or maybe you're an LLC to get started, you're going to have to sort of keep track of all of those expenses. So running those numbers, um, it starts off with just a rough like, okay, what do I need to live? Like from a salary standpoint. And, you know, is that 100,000? I don't know what it, what it is by you, but let's just say it's 100,000, right? You're going to have to take off taxes off the top of that. You're going to have to divide that by the number of months, right? And then you're going to look at, how much money you're going to need to bring in each month. And that is colored by all of your other expenses. Like you need internet and a computer and all. So in that spreadsheet has all these line items. You fill them in, you decide how much profit you want to have. And that determines what you're going to have to bill per hour. And I think it's going to, it might be a little scary (laughs) to you because you're going to have to see how that fits into your market, you know, and see if someone with a middle income is going to be willing to pay that. And it's really hard. You know, it's, those are hard exercises to do, but it's also a great thing to do at the very beginning because exactly you you can start eliminating things that just don't make sense or just say like, yeah, this thing really needs to be a nonprofit. And that's why I think it'd be like some of your first conversations here ought to be talking to those other people in this space that are trying to make a go of it. Cause I bet, I bet they would have, the best insight for you. Like, oh, you should definitely do this or definitely don't do that. Like the people in Utah, I mean, they've been trying for a couple of years to get this project kind of off the ground, right? And funded. And it looks like they may be doing some design build. Is that right? Yes. And they're, um, you know, they've partnered with AmeriCorps and do a lot of kind of side things um, and have through their time there over the years, kind of, I think it kind of took a while for them to get community buy-in. And now they're like on the council, city council and things like that. But yeah, it's been a slow um, and things have taken different directions. And Does that excite you when you see that process? Does that make you excited? The, the community aspect does. Yes. Well, that's uh, good. Cause I look at that. I'm like, Oh my God, that would be a nightmare. <laughs> So we need people like you. I'm really, I mean, I was, I was excited to see that you had come up with this proposal because it takes a brave person to pull this off. And it's a, it's a lot more work to make it work. But what you told me at the beginning of this conversation was very different, a very different business idea than the one that I had when I started this. And it was, you know, mine is more of a lifestyle business. I wanted to support my family and 
you know, make a great life for everybody that I know around me, but it, you know, it doesn't have the same impact out in the world that, you know, a business like yours could. So I have to do that. I have to seek those things out in other ways by giving back on YouTube or elsewhere, but it's not this, it's definitely not the same. It's not as kind of visceral. I think I would encourage you to figure out the numbers first, because that's the only way that you're going to be able to help these people is if you can survive first. Like if you don't put food on your table, there's no way you're right. going to have room to help them. Um, and then, and then also I, I didn't mention this, but you know, when you talked about working with a contractor, um, who, who, and you were saying like, maybe they can kind of give up a, like give you a break on the construction. Is that what, was that your idea? That is a hundred percent contingent on finding the right person that I have not found. So that is a like shooting for the moon kind of theory. Yeah. Cause I would say, you know, as you start to think about those things and, and think about this community kind of holistically, who typically works for contractors? What do you mean? Subcontractors? <laughs> well, like what, you know, people of what income level? Right. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm checking. Yeah. So, I mean, that is a, a service in and of itself is funding, um, providing. You're extract, you're trying to extract the value from middle income and then you're trying to give it to the low income, but you're asking the contractor who employs the lower income people to take a cut, you know, to take a lower fee. It doesn't help. Ultimately it hurts the people you're trying to help. So I would, I would just encourage you to really think through that model yeah. holistically and, and think, I mean, as you're thinking about how a business operates, right, we're looking for value in the marketplace and we're looking for ways as business owners to extract that value in a way that helps the person who's buying it and it helps you, right? It helps both of us. Otherwise, there's no transaction. Yeah. And I think um, as I think about your business model, the more I think about it, the more I think you want to control all those aspects from design through construction because construction there's a ton of margin in that if you think about where what a material costs and what you know an installed cost is there's a ton of margin there and a lot of that's represented in labor and a lot of it's represented in you know oversight and you are perfectly positioned to oversee construction right but oftentimes architects in those projects the lower end projects they're cut out because they're seen as not as a value add you can be that value add, right? From the beginning to the end. And that could be this sort of holistic business model that also works to support the community right from the inside. You know, the people who are building these homes benefit too. And I think that could be a an interesting thing. Um, whether or not you want to take on the construction piece is up to you. I know plenty of architects who are doing that now just because that's a point that we don't get to control very often. And it's a real, I mean, you know, you've been in this business long enough to know how painful getting a building built is. Yes, exactly. And being able to work repeatedly with the same contractor is a huge time saver. It is. Because you learn how to, you know, you know what you've worked through in the past and can build on that. And yeah. And then, you know, also, if you're thinking about this kind of family of details, you know, you're saying these plan sets and this family of details, like, those are going to evolve over time, right? Like right. That's what I've known, known about the plan sets that I've done. It's like they're, they're fro this frozen moment in time and then to go back and update them for new, you know, vapor profiles or, you know, new insulation or whatever else is in, new right. in the market. It's a real pain. But if you have a partner, you know, you're creating this kind of entity that is nimble in a way that you can pivot and change and update things in real time. And it doesn't have to be this kind of, legal game you know like, yeah you know what this is like when you're when you yeah. sign a contract with a contractor man it's just you have to really be concerned with all those things and i think um to me that's kind of where i would look if i were you i'm not telling mm -hmm. you what to do but that's probably one of the one of the places i'd look hardest so i noticed uh i could be wrong on this but i I didn't see a lot of remodel work in your portfolio. Um, was that a, an intentional choice? And if so, why? And what are your red lights and green lights there? Yeah. So for me, uh, I've done a ton of remodel work. I don't just don't put it on the site uh, okay. because I don't want more of it. <laughs> your portfolio, 
you put forth what you want more of, and I don't want more remodeling work. The, the trouble that I have with remodel work is it costs just as much as um, new work here. So I don't know if there's any sort of cost savings where you are, but the per square foot cost is as the, is the same, if not even more uh, than doing new work. And I've just found the the quality of the homes around here and the discussions that people have when they come with a remodel project, just a lot different. Um, people, there's a lot of kind of camps here that were built in, let's say the 50s and 60s. So there's a ton of lakes around here and people are buying up all these sort of lakeside properties and then they're, you know, using the camps or remodeling these camps. And they're oftentimes, they were just built by somebody's uncle and they're in poor shape. And so the discussion is always like, this is in bad shape. Well, we just want to remodel it. And you get down to the foundation and you're, you've left with six posts and they're all falling down. And they're like, why didn't we just build from scratch? And so that's just been my experience here. When you're in a place where you know, housing stock is already existing and budgets are low and you don't have money for infrastructure, it makes perfect sense, you know, from a, you know, sustainability standpoint, it, it, that's, that's the best thing to do. So I think you need to approach those projects from a sensibility standpoint rather than like an economic or what you want in a portfolio necessarily. I made those decisions for portfolio reasons and just, they're just better clients. The, the ones that want to build de novo, they're just better clients for me. Are you looking at a lot of renovation work around there? Is that typical? Uh, yeah. Well, right now in the Birmingham area, housing is booming, um, has been for the last, you know, six years kind of thing. Um, and there's, a, um, yeah, there's a ton of remodel work happening. Uh, but, you know, and I don't even, I still have the, does the client even value an architect's issue, you know? Yeah. And uh, what kind of budgets do you think you're talking about there? Um, less than 200,000. Okay. I mean, you can, you can make a business doing that. I promise you, you can, it's just more of a volume business, you know, it's, and, um, it's actually not a bad place to start. And I think, uh, I mean, I don't know what kind of income level we're talking with those people who are willing to put a couple hundred thousand into a house, but I bet they'd be willing to consider an architect. I mean, I've spoken to plenty of people around here who want to do that kind of work. It's just not like I'm looking in the million and a half to $3 million house range, as opposed mm -hmm. to like, you know, sure. to, just, it's all good getting started. And I don't want you to compare your day zero with my year seven. Like it's not mm -hmm. a fair comparison in so many ways. And so, you know, you should know that I did all that stuff and it's good for you to do it all too, because in that process, you determine what you like doing and what you don't like doing. You may decide you love doing those renovations because they're probably pretty easy. You know, you can, you can affect some pretty good change in someone's lifestyle by helping them out. Right. Yeah. You know, retool. I mean, you can get probably a lot of what you're hoping to help people on the lower end of the scale. You can get a lot of that sort of creative energy into those projects. They're just, you know, they're probably not going to be, you know, portfolio bangers, but I mean, you don't need a lot of those. You just need a couple of those, you know, and, and they should all be focused on what you're hoping to do. And I think if you build this kind of cool story around it, almost whatever you do is going to be good, you know, get it photographed nicely and have the story, just like create that story that someone can buy into and say, yeah, like, of course I want to work with you because when I work with you, like, I know I'm helping all these other people too. And whether that's from you're bringing that labor force in to do the remodel or what it is, I mean, that's like, I think developing the story is kind of cool actually. Do you think that could work with um, like, as that, I mean, it's, there's kind of the retail model, right? Like, you know, you, pay a little bit more for your nice well-made sweater and a portion of the profit goes to provide someone else with the sweater kind of thing. Do you think um, that is a um, viable selling point in working with middle income to say, hey, 
um, middle income clients say, hey, this is um, a portion of this is going to support, you know? I think, uh, I think you, this is just my take. I think you make it a part of the business model that it's baked in from day one, because if you don't, you're going to get certain people who are like, that's nice, but like, I'd rather have it for a cheaper you know, price kind of thing. So I would just say, this is what we do. This is why we do it. And this is what we provide and, and say, you know, it's the kind of rising tide lifts all ships. And we appreciate you supporting us because in turn that supports this whole big flywheel. I wouldn't like mm -hmm. distinguish and say we give 10% of our profits. I would just, I mean, it's again, this is totally up to you, but I, I would make it just part of the baked in ethos of the brand and the company. And those are the kinds of things that when people are deciding who to hire, they make decisions based on what the story is, you know, how much they like the person. And, you know, I would say just make that a part of your story and just be, be passionate about it. You know, that's just like back to minute one when you and I were talking, like, why do you want to do this? Like, what, yeah. what makes you want to do that? Yeah.